Hello everyone, my name's Natalie and I'm a manager in the Corporate Advisory Division at HLB Manjad in Sydney. I'm very interested in the ESG space and helping organisations on their ESG journey. So I'm here today to discuss the implications of ESG, what it means for your organisation now and into the future, and steps that can be taken now. So I would like to start by highlighting that NFPs are naturally aligned with the purpose of ESG, which stands for environmental, social and governance. ESG can be a tricky concept to define specifically. However, one definition is the ability to maintain a healthy environmental, social and economic systems in balance indefinitely, which means doing no harm. A lot of the purposes, missions and visions for not-for-profits are around doing the right thing or making a difference and will likely be aligned to at least one of the three pillars of ESG, perhaps particularly around the E, environment, or the S, social. Therefore, your organisation is likely to already be doing something about ESG as a general concept, but may not specifically define these activities under one of the ESG pillars, may not report on it, or may not communicate this to stakeholders. So the implications of ESG. ESG reporting is not yet mandated. So there are both some short-term and long-term implications for your organization now. In the short term, your organization is not required to report on ESG. However, organizations that begin to act on ESG may be able to benefit in a number of ways, which I'll run through shortly. In the longer term, reporting on ESG will likely become mandated. The International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation has created the International Sustainability Standards Board, the IWSB, which is an initiative to develop high quality standards for sustainability disclosure and accountancy. And the exposure drafts were released earlier this year in March. There are two exposure drafts, one on general sustainability related disclosures and the other on climate related disclosures. What this indicates is that ESG reporting is on the horizon. However, there's not yet an indication of how this reporting will be rolled out and especially when it will come into play for not-for-profits. So it may take some time before your organization is actually required to report on ESG under these standards. So in terms of implications, one thing I would like to highlight is the prevalence of action on climate related activities, which follows on from COP26 and the attention surrounding climate change from governments and society as a whole. Climate related action is therefore an area to consider focusing on in your organization, as it is likely an area of strong interest to your stakeholders. So keeping in mind that reporting will not be mandated in the, media, in the immediate short term, I would like to focus on the short term implication for your organization, which I like to frame as the benefits to your organization of ESG reporting and or action. So these benefits can be grouped into funding, competitiveness and staff. Under funding, you may have heard of the term responsible investing, which is spoken about a lot at the moment. Essentially, investors are increasingly looking to invest into companies based on their ESG performance. So if a business can demonstrate it is doing something about ESG, this will result in increased access to funding from investors with sustainability focused mandates or interest. In terms of what this means for NFPs, there are two things to consider. Either now or into the future, there may be a requirement to disclose what ESG action is being taken by your organization when you're trying to gain access to funding. This ties into the concept of impact measurement. Organizations that can demonstrate, both qualitatively and quantitatively, the impact they are generating may be more likely to receive funding compared to an organization that cannot demonstrate their impact in dollar terms. Secondly, if you want to improve your organization's overall ESG position and you have financial investments, an action you can take now is to review your investments and evaluate what these investment vehicles actually do with the funds invested and make sure that these activities are aligned with your organization's ESG position. For example, if your organization determines it does not want to contribute to the generation of fossil fuels, you may want to make sure that the funds you invest um, with other organizations or companies are not used in the activity of generating fossil fuels. Under competitiveness, uh, competitiveness can cover a lot of topics, but some of the key benefits are highlighted on the slide. Stakeholder demand is increasing. 
So not-for-profits that respond to this demand by actively doing something about ESG and communicating this to their stakeholders will increase their brand and reputation within the marketplace. For NFPs, this can be important in developing or maintaining key relationships with stakeholders such as donors, government, and perhaps clients and their families. ESG action can also lead to long-term cost savings, either directly or indirectly, but of course this will vary between organisation and industry. An example of direct cost savings would be any ESG initiative that leads to a reduction in electricity bills. There are also cost savings to be had in the general improvement in productivity that may result from ESG action, such as more engaged staff or reduced staff turnover, which leads into the next benefit of staff. A common theme we hear about from not-for-profits and what we're seeing in the market generally is the difficulty in attracting and retaining quality staff. And there is so much movement between jobs. With the increased awareness around ESG and the general perception being that organisations should be doing more on ESG and improving its position, adopting an ESG policy and communicating this may be a strategy that actually results in attracting and retaining staff, particularly in the not-for-profit space, where staff are generally conscious about contributing to a social or environmental cause or to the greater good. So it's clear that there are many benefits for not-for-profits that choose to do something about ESG now, but these benefits can also be framed as risks if limited ESG action is taken. For example, if your competitors are starting to report on their ESG action, your organisation may be impacted in terms of funding, staff or competitiveness. So an implication for right now would be to find out what your competitors are doing around ESG. If it turns out your competitors are not reporting on ESG and you choose to improve your organization's reporting and or ESG position, you may be better placed to tap into these benefits that I've just run through. So what steps can you take now? ESG is a broad topic, so it can be very daunting to know where to start. But as I mentioned earlier, not-for-profit's natural alignment with the purpose of ESG means that your organization has already started on its ESG journey. In the short term, it's important to understand where your organization is now and consider some small wins that could be taken to help improve your position. In terms of where you are now, you could begin by dissecting the E, S and G pillars and linking, uh, listing the ways in which your organization's activities are addressing these factors. Perhaps you can refer to the UN Sustainable Development Goals to identify what goals your organization is currently acting towards and then putting these goals into one of those ESG pillars. For example, many organizations are doing something about the issues such as modern slavery or gender equality, which would fall under the S in ESG. Once you've mapped out your organization's activities under the ES and G pillars, you will then be able to document these initiatives and put it into an ESG plan and start communicating this both to internal stakeholders as well as external stakeholders. In terms of small wins your organization could uh, attempt to achieve now, perhaps an easier place to start would be reducing your organization's impact on the environment. And the good news is there's lots of things that can be done in that sense, and some of which your organization probably already has in action. One example is to reduce electricity usage generally, or you can engage with your electricity provider to go onto a greener option which could source electricity from renewable sources rather than fossil fuels. If your energy provider doesn't have this option and you're not sure where to start, Greenpeace actually have the Green Electricity Guide, which ranks electricity providers based on how clean their energy is. In the mid to longer term, ESG action would include developing and actioning an ESG plan and a carbon footprint plan. I mentioned both an ESG and carbon footprint plan because as mentioned earlier, the IWSB has two exposure drafts, one on general sustainability and one on climate related risks. So this appears to be the direction the reporting is going towards. Things to note when developing these plans is to ensure specific actions are developed to improve your organization's impact. Ensure these actions have KPIs to monitor progress. Reporting is also key and communication to stakeholders. So I hope you've learned something new about ESG in today's presentation and have some ideas on how you can continue your organization's ESG journey. If you want to discuss any aspects of this presentation, please contact me with the details on the slide. Thank you.